Um, so just to start with, um, introductions. Um, so Diamond Light Source is the UK's national synchrotron facility uh, based in Harwell, just outside a place called Digcot in Oxfordshire. Um, we currently have 33 operational beamlines, of which two do small angle scattering. Uh, one has a variable camera length and is the, the kind of workhorse of, of Diamond for small angle scattering. And the other beamline is more reserved for doing biological scattering and has a fixed camera length and also fixed energy as well. Uh, myself, I'm a data analysis scientist at Diamond Light Source. Um, I work as part of the Dawn Science Programming Group, and I work with the small angle scattering beamline I-22, which is the uh, more uh, workhorse flexible beamline at I-22. Um, my experimental background uh, is more in kind of self-assembled systems and polymer science, which is what I did, what I was looking at when I studied both my undergraduate degree and my PhD. Uh, and I have an analytical background um, in surface forces, small angle scattering, and also X-ray reflectivity. So, first question, why? Why would we need a modular data correction, I mean, or data correction sequence? Obviously, this is something that has been looked at in great detail over many years. Small angle scattering isn't a technique that's just come along, it's been around for a very long time. And uh, the main driver that we had for this is that if you go out and have a look at different ways of correcting either small angle scattering data, small angle X-ray scattering data, small angle scattering, small angle neutron scattering data, there are a thousand and one different papers, publications, uh, and different ways of doing things. There are also a number of um, corrections that are put in in uh, well, just different areas and different blobs. So maybe you've got a, a transmission correction, and that's the only correction you do. Uh, maybe there are people who do slightly more advanced corrections, but miss some of the more basic ones. So the idea behind uh, this modular sequence was to come up with a recommendation for a framework that people could then look at and say, okay, well, I've got this kind of data set. I should be looking at doing these corrections, and here's where they came from. As ever, you have to be careful um, because there is a, a, a potential that you say, okay, well, now we have a new standard, that's wonderful. Um, and then we just end up with yet another paper and just another recommendation and just another competing standard. Um, but what I hope to get across through, through this lecture um, is why we believe that you should look at this as a, as a reference framework for your corrections, um, because we believe that it does actually deliver a very robust way and a, a more physically derived way of getting from raw data to process data, whether that's a 2D frame that you want to look at or whether it's a reduced I versus Q curve that you've been seeing quite a few of in Brian's talk just now. Um, so the paper itself is called the Modular Small Angle X-ray Scattering Data Correction Sequence. Um, and if you have a look at the first line in the abstract, data correction is probably the least favorite activity amongst users experimenting with small angle X-ray scattering. I believe that comes right out of Brian's previous talk about trying to grab his people's attention. <laughs> for their publications. Um, again, we wanted people to look at this work and to, and to really consider it, um, rather than just kind of toss it on the, uh, the pile of standards, so to speak. So the sequence itself is very long. I will show it mainly for illustrative purposes, um, but you can see that this is not um, for the faint of hearts. There are a lot of different potential steps depending on whether you're um, looking at a sample that's dispersed as a, as a kind of simple sample, so maybe something in a, a matrix that of a very low medium, or maybe it's a powder, something like that, or whether we have something that's dispersed in a medium um, where we need to do more background subtractions. We might need to subtract out a, a solvent as well as also subtracting out the instrumentational background. But the amount of solvent that we might need to subtract might vary, so we may need to treat that slightly separately. So um, <clears throat> to start off with, um, when we wrote this paper, we, we basically put up some sample considerations. So before you pick your route down the particular um, correction sequence, you need to consider what kind of sample you have. So do you have a solid? Do you have a powder? Do you have a liquid? Are you Are looking at a gas? These are very simple states of matter, but it actually gets you a long way into thinking about the, the routes that you need to follow in order to actually do your corrections and reduction. Um, the three correction processing routes that we went down then is that if you have a very simple sample, so we're just measuring something solid, maybe like a microtone section of bone, so that would be a, a nice solid, 
Um, the only thing you should really need to remove is the instrumental background because there's no, there's no container for that sample. It could just be in air. Um, if you had a powder, then you're looking at something that is, is quite a simple sample, but a powder has another potential layer of complexity insofar as it may be held in a cell and that cell will have windows. Those windows are not part of your instrumentational background per se, uh, and they may change with respect to time. So you might have an instrument background because your instrument is particularly steady that you measure every six hours, but for each sample that you're measuring, you measure a new cell background consummate to what you're trying to measure. This is particularly important if you have inconsistencies in your sample cell holder. Um, so if you have a piece of Kapton, for example, you could expect for a piece of Kapton film that this would be quite constant and you could punch many windows out of it. However, if you had a hand-drawn glass capillary, as are common in many labs, they are pretty much unique and you would therefore need to measure that capillary before you would then measure the sample in that capillary. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, a sample dispersed in a medium. So you then need to build your background subtraction chain up. So you'd have your, your beamline background, sorry, your instrument background, then you would have your, your sample cell, your sample cell with just whatever the, the matrix that you're holding it in. So it would either um, the matrix it's being held in separately or the solvent it's being held in separately or mixture of solvent it's being held in separately. And then also finally the measurements where you actually have not only that, um, but also the instrument with the sample cell in, the solvent mixture and your sample itself. The idea being that if we subtract each one off in turn, we can then isolate that, their contribution to the overall scattering pattern, meaning that all you have left at the end should be the scattering from your sample itself. So, um, in order to highlight all of the different benefits that having all of these background subtractions and all of our routine does, I present to you this, which is a, a 2D wide angle scattering pattern, unfortunately, um, for some data that was uh, gathered by the, the Benning Group uh, back in July 2017 on I-22. Um, this comes warts and all, so here we have a, a section of the detector that has been burned out uh, by too much scattering, and this missing section down here um, is due to uh, literally a missing chunk of the detector where the beam passes through the wide angle uh, scattering regime all the way down to our small angle detector on the beam line. So, in order to subtract the instrumental background in our pipeline, we say first thing you need to input the data, also input a calibration for that, so things like what the energy was, where the beam position on the detector is, or slightly off the detector, um, sample to detector distance, and any angular tilt of that detector, and also a mask. So thinking back to the previous slide um, on the detector, there can be things like missing sections. So these lines here, these black areas, are physical gaps in the detector between these modules that are doing the X-ray detection. We may have dead pixels or hot pixels, and you can also potentially have things like beam stops as well, or other um, things that are eclipsing it. So maybe you have a, an aperture on your sample and that casts a shadow on your detector. You'd want to mask that out as well. Um, as soon as we've done that, the first thing we want to do is estimate our uncertainties. So this comes back to calculating the for a photon counting detector, uh, the Poisson statistics on uh, each pixel so that you know the uncertainty of what the, the count that's been obtained for that particular pixel. We then need to correct for the detected dead time. So there are um, a number of considerations for that that will come from uh, the detector company themselves. So Dectris will provide you uh, with values in order to do this. Uh, the dark current, which is uh, a measure of essentially the background radiation that's hitting the detector. Um, for synchrotrons, this tends to be something that we don't uh, really worry about too much on the basis that the amount or the, the number of counts that we receive per second per pixel is quite low and we count for very short periods of time, so one second or less. For lab instruments, this becomes more of a consideration as you can be measuring for 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes, maybe hours, depending on what you're measuring. And therefore, that, that number of counts per pixel rises quite dramatically and especially in the kind of background regime can be become quite uh, a consideration, quite apparent. Uh, and then we have our first set of what we call commutable corrections. So these are corrections that you don't need to do in this order per se, but they need to be done at this point in the sequence. Um, for all of the previous points, so inputting the data calibration, for example, then estimating uncertainties, that must be done in that order in order to get out 
uh, uncertainty, well, to get out the correct kind of values for uncertainties, to have the correct information present in your pipeline at that time. For time correction, flux correction, transmission correction, and self-absorption, you may not even need a self-absorption correction for some of the samples that you're measuring. Um, but where these things come up, they're, they're multiplicative, so we can more or less um, kind of commute them together. Uh, so the first correction is time. Obviously, we, we want to remove a time dependency from uh, what we're doing, uh, as well as an incoming and transmitted diode, um, so essentially a direct beam measurement and then uh, before hitting the sample, and a direct beam measurement after hitting the sample to work out how much radiation has actually been uh, either absorbed or scattered by the sample, which leads us neatly into the self-absorption correction that follows. The assumption is that for the majority of samples that people are looking at, that there is no absorption of radiation in your sample. And in a, a majority of cases, this is correct, and you can ignore the self-absorption correction. It could be, though, that you have a very dense sample and you have multiple scattering, uh, which is something we'll talk about a bit later. Um, you may also have something that, in the case of, for example, gold, um, also absorbs and re-emits radiation at different wavelengths, in which case um, you then need to take into account how much radiation has been lost due to other processes that maybe you haven't detected on your detector. Right, the flux and transmission corrections. There's a, a very interesting uh, story here, which is that, in actual fact, if you take both the uh, transmission correction, um, it's sorry, the incoming transmission correction and the transmission correction at the detector, uh, we can go through the mathematics to work out that, in actual fact, all we really need to do is the transmission correction. We don't we don't need to do both of these corrections mathematically; they both fall out. Um, however, it is worth noting that although, although this is true, um, you still should obtain an I0 measurement, so an incoming beam measurement, um, because you still need it for the self-absorption correction, which you may require for your sample as well. So going back to that scattering pattern that I've shown you, um, we now have uh, done our first set of corrections and we're going to do our first subtraction on this image. And as we do that, we can see that there is a subtle change mainly here towards where the beam center was. Uh, and for I-22, that correlates to the fact that uh, they have caps on windows, um, both on the entrance to their wide angle detector and also on the exit towards the small angle detector. And that has now quite clearly uh, removed the caps on scattering. Um, so I'll just go back. We can see there's quite a few rings, uh, Dubai share rings on the inside here, that when we do that subtraction are then removed. So, a reasonable start, but nothing particularly to write home about just yet. <coughs> we then need to subtract our dispersant. Um, so uh, we want here to do um, corrections basically on things that aren't to do with the beamline background. So in this commutable set of corrections, uh, we're looking at detector properties and some beam properties as well. So a flat field correction for the detector are all of the pixels that are detecting radiation detecting them equally? If so, fine. However, statistically incredibly unlikely, and therefore you would want to take into consideration whether or not you need to correct the values that you have from those pixels so that they are all the same and homogenous. The angular efficiency of your detector. Um, for, especially for wider angle detectors, such as the detector we're using here, if a ray is coming in at a very small angle, it goes through a very small uh, volume, essentially, of the, uh, the active pixel. If we go to a much higher angle, we can see that all of a sudden we're now transcending a lot more material, uh, and we need to take that into consideration. Um, there are reasons for this to do with the quantum efficiency of your detector as well. Uh, the solid angle correction, uh, which is primarily to do with essentially the, the radiative power that is hitting the detector, um, if you can imagine standing in front of a, an infrared or bar heater, if you stand very close to it, you get very warm very quickly. If you stand on the other side of the room to this particular heater, you will warm up, but it will take you a lot longer. Similarly, if we have two detectors at different distances, they're going to see essentially different amounts of radiation due to the, the amount uh, of the solid angle that they're attending. Uh, so therefore, we need to correct for that so that when we overlay data sets, they overlay in terms of their intensity more accurately rather than being piles off. 
the polarization of your XRA beam. Um, for synchrotrons, we have a, a reasonable handle on this um, because obviously we are generating them in a very um, uniform manner using either undulators or bending magnets. Um, for other sources, your polarization may be greater or less depending on um, what fil uh, filtering you're doing or alternatively the actual method of you generating your source. Uh, the thickness of the sample is also a consideration. If I have a sample that is 10 millimeters thick and I can get x-rays to pass through it, obviously there is a lot more sample there, a lot more scattering will occur than if I have a sample that is one millimeter thick. So therefore, if we want to be able to compare data sets, we need to remove this dependency on thickness. And depending on how you've calculated and, and got to this particular point, you may also need to do an absolute scaling. Uh, so for the mouse instrument itself, because it is recording information, or recording the data in terms of photons per second and applying the kind of rigorous physics that, apply, uh, that happens in the background from there, the amount of scaling I believe required is around about zero. Uh, this will be covered more in the, the next lecture. Um, the, the data sets that Brian has previously obtained for glassy carbon versus the, the reference data set match up almost exactly. In fact, they match up within, er with inside error. However, if you are measuring uh, your direct beam and or transmitted intensity as a function of a current on a uh, beam stop diode, uh, this is just a value. Unless you're using a, a calibrated diode that can then go back to number of photons per second, um, you will get a value that is something at which point you will need a reference standard, um, of which there are numerous around. Um, however, we're currently on well, for I-22 recommending the use of glassy carbon. And then when you measure that scattering pattern, you can compare the intensity that you get uh, when you've applied all the previous corrections apart from the scaling um, to that reference data set and work out what value you need to scale your data set by in order to be on an absolute scale. The final uh, consideration is the displaced volume of your sample. So if we have um, a measurement that we've done for our background, which is instrument plus sample cell plus 100% solvent, and then that, that would be our, our background measurement chain. If we then add on to that instrument plus sample cell plus solvent 90%, because we now have 10% sample, we are, we are going to over subtract the amount of solvent because 10% of the solvent has been displaced by sample. So we need to work out what that, what that value is uh, quantitatively in order to put it into this particular step here. There are, if you know, there are definitely going to be particular regions in Q in which your sample does not scatter, things that you can do to fudge things and cheat. Um, this is the kind of last um, ditch effort of the desperate as opposed to something that we would recommend. However, it is usually very difficult to incredibly accurately work out the displaced volume. Um, nevertheless, it is a step that is required if you're going to be rigorous. So I would encourage you all to um, know roughly how much sample there actually is um, per volume of your sample. It is also worth noting that for dilute samples, so things that are roughly 1% or less concentration, uh, the displaced volume contribution is such that actually the majority of the time you do not witness a massive oversubtraction if you see a sub oversubtraction at all. Um, so this is a, a slide I've used here to demonstrate uh, the solid angle correction. Um, so we can see here that we have three data sets put together. Um, I'm going to focus more on the, the latter two down here. And we can see that the overlap between these two data sets is very good in terms of um, the intensity profiles that we see. In the raw data, um, what you would see is that these wide angle uh, curves over here would be of a much higher intensity because they are, they are seeing essentially a lot more uh, radiation than the, the small angle detector is down here. Okay, so going back to uh, the uh, demonstration we have here, so we've subtracted out uh, beamline contributions and cell contributions. And now what we are going to do is to subtract out the contributions uh, from the solvent, I believe. Yes. So we're going to take into consideration the, sorry, this is the, the beamline structure in which we're now going to take the considerations for the cell that this thing is being held in and also the solvent as well. And if we do that, we suddenly see that we move to this scattering pattern. 
Um, it is very clear and very apparent that subtracting out the correct amount of solvent and also the cell as well has made not only features that were potentially visible in the previous scattering pattern, these kind of brighter rings here. So if I go back a slide, you can see there is a ring here. You can see there are some outer rings up here. But also it really brings out milder features. So at this kind of higher Q range out here, you could say, yes, maybe there are some features to be seen. However, all of a sudden they become very distinct. And therefore, if you were to reduce this to an I versus Q profile, rather than seeing very small features resolved against your data, it suddenly enhances those and makes them actually much easier um, if you are, well, it makes it much easier for you to perform analysis on this data. The small angle data especially, which is usually quite low or has a very low information density, resolving these features, especially if they're weak, mild, or kind of oscillatory in their nature, can become very important. I can highlight this with a data set um, from the i22 tutorial data set, whereby if you don't correct your data and you basically just say, input my calibration, input my mask, and reduce my data, we end up with a curve that has some mild oscillations in. And you could fit this, for sure. Um, however, one might be tempted to say that these were quite polydispersed spheres. Um, this is not necessarily a particularly wonderful scattering pattern. Also, um, although it's not necessarily very clear, the uncertainty is on this because you're receiving a lot of radiation and you're not subtracting off contributions from elsewhere. Um, you can see the, the error bars on here are infinitesimally small, essentially. If we perform all of the corrections on this data set, not only do we see these oscillations massively amplified, which will make your fitting much easier, but also these uh, error bars here have suddenly become a lot more apparent. When you're trying to fit data, especially if you're doing model-based fitting, uh, if you have really small error bars, you're essentially telling your fitting engine that this data is 100% accurate, and therefore there is almost no room for deviation in your fit. You must fit this curve precisely. And a lot of fitting engines will choke very hard on this because they will not know how to interpret this. Um, if you give more reasonable error bars in intensity and although not plotted in this data set, also in Q, you're giving it more of a, an area in which to fit. By doing so, you're giving the fitting engine a fighting chance of trying to analyze your data. Um, these polystyrene spheres here are from Sigma Ulrich and are used as a calibrant for dynamic light scattering machines. So in theory, these should be very, very, very good, nice monodispersed particles for use as a calibrant. Most people's samples are not very precise monodispersed uh, particular creations for whatever they're trying to look at. They will tend to be maybe multimodal. So they might have different sizes of particle in them or different size of feature. They'll probably be polydispersed. They may not scatter so strongly and many other considerations as well at which point these very nice oscillations that are quite straightforward to fit, it would suddenly become very difficult to fit data that, if, especially if you haven't put corrections in and given a kind of error bounding for the fitting engine to look in, it suddenly becomes very difficult to actually do anything with that data. So that more or less goes through uh, the entire pipeline, depending on what it is that you're trying to look at. The next logical question is how? So we've got this paper, and that's great. We've got a whole load of recommendations, also great. Um, but usually the stumbling block is that people go, okay, well, that's fine, but what are we going to do next with this? Um, so for Diamond Light Source, uh, we have some uh, documentation that is available online uh, that takes you through using our data analysis software, Dawn, how to build up these different pipelines. Um, so we've got reductions here for absolute units, transmission corrected, and then a number of other more, I guess, debugging diagnostics type pipelines. Uh, and we go through not only how to build up these pipelines and what they are, but also give an example data set so that you can work through these as well. Uh, that leads me onto a small introduction into Dawn uh, that I will give you, um, because I gather that there are a number of people that, although interested in small angle X-ray scattering, also have other more general interests in, in X-ray uh, diffraction or pairwise diffraction as well. Um, so. This is the um, processing interface for Dawn. I will bring up a live demonstration in a moment, um, but I'll just take you through a few things before that. Um, so over on the left-hand side of the screen here, we have the Project Explorer with some data. And if you expand this out, this is where your input files, uh, all of them will essentially be located. We then have the data slice view here, which is when you've loaded a file in, uh, 
essentially the files that you are intending to process. So here is a list of everything on your file system, but here is a list of just individual files you're interested in processing. You then have a little preview of the data set that you're about to process down here. Before over here, you have the processing and model tabs. Processing is where you will put in steps for your whatever processing it is that you wish to do. And the model here, once you highlight a step, will show you the different things that you can configure for that step. And then finally down here is a preview of the output that this particular processing pipeline will generate based on the input data down here. So before I go into the demonstration, I'm just going to th go through a quick glossary of some terms. Um, so there are different file formats for different things. Um, for Diamond, we use a file format, a file format called the Nexus file. Um, this is based on an HDF5 file container. Um, and the, the Nexus file aspect of it is basically a way of, we've all agreed that we're going to tag the data in a certain way. Um, this is mainly aimed at the neutron, x-ray, and muon science community. Um, but it is extensible. Um, and if other communities were interested, um, please do express interest and we'll see what we can do. I, I know that there are particular things in there for people who do uh, in situ UV vis measurements as well as also x-ray measurements. And there is appropriate tagging for that. Uh, a processing chain is a list of operations that are going to be performed on a particular data set. And data sets and slices. So a data set is a full n-dimensional array, which I'll go over in the next slide. And a slice is a view on a part of that data set. So what do I mean by a fully n-dimensional array? So at the top here, we have uh, a single frame of data. The last two numbers in this particular uh, list corresponds to the y and x dimensions of the detector face itself. And what we have here for the single frame example is a single frame in time acquired at a single locational position. But we, we don't have to stop there. We could say, okay, that's fine, but I really want to, for each, say I'm measuring a rack of capillaries, for this particular position where this capillary is, I would like to take five frames of data. Either you're looking for a kinetic process, or you're looking to see whether there's beam damage, or you just want to take those frames and average them to get better statistics. That then bumps this particular dimension, so number of frames gathered at each locational position, up by however many frames you've taken. So we now have a stack of five frames. This is an, a, an array of four dimensions. Um, if we take one of these frames and we just look at one image, that is one slice of that data set. We could then build that up. So um, I'm looking at a map of something. Um, you could have a, you're looking across a sample in a line. Uh, maybe you've got, um, again, I pick the uh, example of a capillary. I'm heating it, but I'm heating it on one end and I want to see what happens over that temperature gradient. Um, so I'll measure here and I'll measure here and I'll measure here and I will take five frames at each data point, so we then, or each positional point. So we then have uh, three as our highest dimension, so that's our three positions in physical space, with five frames gathered at each position, so this remains five, and then detector uh, Y and X. Lastly, uh, in the examples I've got here, is a two-dimensional map. So I've got a sample, it's a square of something. Um, bone might be a good example for this, or possibly a polymer sample or something. And I want to scan nine points on this sample. Now, as you can see, the number of dimensions in our array has now increased by one, hence the n-dimensional aspect of it. Um, so we can increase the number of dimensions for whatever it is that we're measuring. But here we have three uh, entries in x and three entries in y, so three positions in x, three positions in y. Uh, or the other way around, depending on which particular um, way you've scanned your sample. Five frames at each position, and then the detector frame size over here. You could also imagine expanding this by, say, another dimension if you wanted to change something. So if you were measuring a polymer sample, maybe you're increasing temperature, and you want to see what happens over the entire sample. If you had a sample of biological material and you were stretching it, you may want to add another dimension for different different strains that you're measuring this at. Um, the world is almost your oyster. Um, obviously there are limitations for how much you can physically store on disk, 
um, but also how many dimensions some pieces of software are willing to cope with. You all now have a very neat picture of Dawn. Um, so I thought what I would do is to just quickly take people through um, a number of things in Dawn that one can one can do quite straightforwardly. Um, I believe, if everything is, is still going to plan, I should have the tutorial data set on hand. If not, I may have to uncompress it. Um, so this is the, the default view when you start up a new instance of Dawn. And this is called DataViz. The idea behind DataViz is very straightforward. You load in some data, big plotting area so that you can see your data. And uh, the data that's sent you over here allows you to look through your Nexus file and try and see uh, what data uh, set it is in your file you might want to look at. So you can imagine uh, in an i22 data file, you could have potentially both small and wide angle scattering, and you would like to um, go between them. Okay. Um, so building on that, there's also then um, a series of different tabs up here. We call these tabs perspectives. Um, a perspective is essentially a grouping of tools um, that are put together in a user interface in order to achieve a particular workflow. So here we've got files in, plotting area, pick a data set. If I click on the processing perspective over here where you can do data processing, we then switch so that we have files in, files that we're going to process, input, the processing pipeline, and then output as well. So this is a different collection of tools for doing a particular task. Um, and the final perspective that I will quickly highlight um, is the powder calibration perspective. So again, we still have files in, uh, sorry, file browser here, um, files that we can look at. And then because we're doing a calibration, we have some information about our calibrants and what we actually want to calibrate. Um, the uh, actual image of what you're trying to calibrate against comes up here. A number of parameters for what you're trying to um, fit. And then also down here, a check. So this will essentially reduce your data down to 1D and then show you where your calibrant uh, lines are with vertical lines. Um, and then you can see the, the I versus Q trace or the I versus two thesis trace in order to work out whether or not uh, that calibration is actually sufficient for what you're trying to achieve. So if we have a quick look in data and examples, um, I will cheat slightly because I don't have a full data set on my machine because I didn't uh, get a hold of that in time. Um, I can load up one of our example data sets, which is um, a CBF file obtained at the ESRF. And if I clear my current processing pipeline, um, we can see that we've loaded in a file from our file system. We put it in here saying that we want to process it and we have uh, an input down here. This particular CBF file has both its calibration data uh, and some information about um, the source itself already loaded in. So it is potentially possible for me to have a single step pipeline. If I go to azimuthal integration, um, whereby I go from this here, the azimuthal integration is taking, um, going from beam center outwards, counting random rings, taking the, the uh, bins of intensity and returning to me this plot down here, which is Q versus intensity. Um, in any plot in Dawn, if you click on the plot itself to bring focus to it, and then press either the Y or X keys on the keyboard, both together, um, you can log scale the curve in that particular dimension. Um, the reason of saying this is more of a kind of, I guess, uh, diagnostics thing for just putting in a single, uh, single step, as was highlighted with the pipelines that we have on our website, as you can see that there are dips in the data set here, here, here basically all over the place. Um, that is because there is this grid pattern on the data. So if I insert another step, and I put in a, and I put in a masking step, and I want, Um, so going back to the image, we can see that there is this grid pattern, uh, as well as also a beam stop arm. If I put in a lower value here of zero, uh, 
we should see because these these grid values and uh, hot pixel values on Pilatus detectors are recorded as negative numbers that we get a green grid pop up which is all of the Pilatus uh, gaps highlighted as well as also um, occasional hot pixels and other features that have been masked out for us by the detector so if I zoom in on this area of the detector down here we can see that um, a number of pixels down here have been recorded as faulty and will therefore be masked out as well. If I then go back to the integration, we can see that the dips that were there previously have all now been removed as these are not uh, to do with the data set at all, but purely artifacts arising from the detector itself. Um, I won't go extensively through pipelines. Um, this is more of a tutorial about um, if I so clicking on this particular um, little golden asterisk here, it brings up a list of every single processing step available. Um, you can filter through the list by typing in known phrases, Oops, subtract. Um, so that, and that's how you can easily add in a, a step. Um, but because some of the pipelines that we've come up with are quite long, obviously entering these things in by hand every time is very laborious. Uh, the reason for on our website having a number of pipelines is that at the top here um, there is an option to save a configured pipeline when you're happy with it as well as also load a configured pipeline and I believe in the next session uh, well, the, the next session based on data corrections um, that Glenn will be taking you through loading in some of the default pipelines for the mouse and how best to utilize those in order to extract your data. So um, this is more of an introduction to the processing perspective and how one might go about using it. Um, there are a number of processing steps available. And if you have a data set loaded, so in this case, an image, when I click here to enter in a new step, every single processing step that is available to me here is a processing step that I can do on an image. The reason that I mention this is, if I at the moment type in Python, because I can insert Python scripts into um, my processing pipeline, you will see that I can have a Python script for Savu, which is for doing tomographic reconstructions. That's a, a separate package. Um, I can go image to XY, so I can have a Python script that takes an image and will return the line plot. Or I can have a Python script that works on an image and returns an image. However, if I type in as uh, in Muthal integration, at this particular point, I now have an XY or a, a one dimensional data set. If I now type in Python, we can see that my options have changed. It's tailored it to the data set that I have. So I know that it's not an image. So being able to run a Python script that can convert an image to an image is no longer a viable thing to do. Um, so now instead of having image to image and image to XY, I only have XY to XY. I can only take in a Python script that's going to take in a data set of one dimension and return one dimension as well. If you're interested in this uh, in more detail, um, there is an option here which is show input and output ranks. And that will show you in the, what you put in the input rank, so whether it should be an image or a larger dimension, and what it's going to output as well, so that you can see what matching it's doing there. I'll turn that off for now. I will clear that. Um, in terms of the time that we have left, uh, and also other functionality, um, I'm just going to find where this file is on my file system. That. If I now go to DataViz over here, there are a number of ways of loading files into DataViz. Um, if you have two screens, which I do normally, but not at the moment, uh, you can drag and drop files uh, from one um, uh, area into another. I could also half screen and uh, drop files in from there. Um, but for now, um, what I'm going to do is go to File and Open File. That is probably one of the easier ways of opening a file. Um, at which point I can go here, and this is the file that we have just had loaded, and I can open that. Down at the bottom here, you may notice that there's a, a, essentially the path that I've just been to, as well as also a box next to it. 
It is possible using this in a similar way to how you might use a, a command line or terminal or um, prompt, depending on what your background is, um, to navigate your file system using the usual kind of forward slash and then some folder name and then forward slash and some file name. Uh, it also accepts wildcards as well. So although I've now loaded this file from this folder, if I just type in star, um, it will load me every file that's in that folder as well and tell me that it couldn't open one particular file. Um, you can also do things like star.nxs just to load Nexus files, such as this one here, uh, or we could do star.cbf. Um, so we can see that in this particular file, now that I've selected it, there is one data set, which is the image that it has um, found inside it. And if I tick this tick box down here, I now get the same image that I had before. With data viz, obviously the uh, main kind of uh, focal point of this is to show you the data. Uh, and therefore, we put it as the largest thing on screen. Underneath where, what data sets you have in this file at the bottom is uh, information about how you want to plot your data. So it's not impossible that you could have a stack of one-dimensional line plots. When DataViz initially looks at this, it won't know that it's a stack of line plots. It'll think it's an image. And therefore, it will display you essentially a, a streak plot or a heat map of uh, your data. Um, you can, if you want to, change the plot type. Uh, so you, I could plot this as line plots, a text table in one dimension, two dimensions, surface or waterfall. I'm going to pick line plot for now. And I have now up a representation of one line uh, going across that image. So if I look down here, I can see uh, information about uh, what it's plotting. So we've got the dimensions of the image. We're displaying X as the first dimension. And then I can scroll through the zeroth dimension up here. So I've got this little box here. If I click, if I make this a little bit larger so you can see what that says, that says start, stop, and step. Um, so if I click here on this, it brings up a scroll bar where I can say I want to just scroll through the data and see what there is. Or alternatively, I can put in I would really like to look at entry, let's say, 1,000 in my data set, and it will take me directly there. So that's single entry. Um, I could say I want to look at 10 line plots, so start, colon, stop, and we know that we now get 10 lines plus on top of each other. The more that you plot, the larger your legend will become. In order to combat this, <laughs> the easiest thing to do is if you click on the plot tools up here, we can click to hide the legend. And then that gives us just the plot data back. This becomes especially important when you're plotting, say, 50, 100, whatever number of lines, because all of a sudden your legend will become much bigger uh, than the actual plot. Finally, uh, for plotting data, I could say this. So I want to look at um, 100 entries in this particular file, but I only want to look at each 10th entry, uh, which is the step option. So this will return to me uh, 100 line plots, Ooh, apparently with one massive outlier, so I will log scale this in Y. Um, but I, uh, sorry, yes, this will return to me 10 line plots um, over the, the 100 that I've asked for, but with a step of 10 in between each one. So this means that I don't have to plot all 100, um, and I can plot a much smaller subset of that if I'm only interested in trying to find a particular feature. And again, I've got this scroll bar so I can scroll through this, maintaining the step and the start and the stop so that what I am seeing is a representation of 100 uh, lines but plotting every tenth line. Okay, final thing I'd like to show you is if we go back to looking at an image, there are a number of different ways of masking things in Dawn. In processing, there is a processing step called mask outliers in Q. So as it reduces the data for that particular Q bin, it will work out what the average value is. And then from that average value, you can say, well, I'm interested in anything that is within one standard deviation. Anything that's greater than one standard deviation is an outlier. Please dynamically mask my data for me. So that's quite useful for certain operations. You can have threshold masking as well as a processing step, which I've 
briefly demonstrated, uh, meaning if you know that there's a particular maximum value that your detector can take, you could mask based on that uh, dynamically as well. But for things like beam stop arms or maybe a static grid, there's also a number of masking tools available to you um, in the plotting system. So if I click this little downwards arrow, I have an option here called Fast Mask. Uh, this has a number of features that are kind of available as part of um, the, the processing. So again, I can have threshold masking, for example. Um, but it also gives me the ability to draw regions. So I can easily draw boxes, lines, sectors, polygons, and other, other shapes as well. Um, so I will quickly demonstrate how to mask out the grid and very roughly uh, this beam stop as well. So again, if I put in zero as my low threshold here, my grid will be masked out as well as any hot pixels that have already been identified. Um, and then I could draw, let's say, a line. I click the draw button. I can then draw on here very quickly a line. This is by no means very accurate. Um, and then up here I can set properties of this line. So I might want to have quite a thick line because that's quite a, a chunky beam stop. And once I'm happy with the settings for that particular object I want to draw, I can click apply. And now we can see that we have a line that has come up of 10 pixels thick. Um, this is quite a large image, so 10 pixels doesn't necessarily get you very far. Maybe I should make that 30 and click apply. Now it's much more obvious. You will note that as I went from 10 to 30, the overall brightness of the image changed, or the, the apparent brightness of the image changed. And that is because in Dawn, if you have mass pixels, they are ignored. Uh, the way that the histogramming is calculated is based on um, some values that are percentages of um, the value or the intensity values that are present. So if you mask out the most intense parts of your pattern, you'll suddenly notice the, the more subtle features suddenly become a lot more visible. There are another of uh, there are a number of other tricks that you can perform. Um, so if you load in a calibration file, if you have a sector or a ring or a circle that you would like to mask out but that you know is centered on where the beam is, you can then set, you can center those on that particular point. So maybe you know that the beam is perfectly going through the center of an aperture, which is casting a shadow. You could then say, right, well, I want to center on this and I want to draw a ring that starts here and goes outwards so that I'm masking that particular feature. There's also a tab here for mask processing. Um, so we can invert this mask should we wish to, uh, and then, all we're, now is, all we're now masking out is this very small region here, um, the object that we drew. Um, you can also flip the image, you can flip the mask horizontally and vertically. Um, I have yet to find much functionality for these things. I've drawn the mask directly on the image, but nevertheless, they are afforded to you as options should you want to. At the bottom here, you have a uh, kind of standard list of options, so we can undo things that we've done. We can clear the mask, although it should be noted if you click clear, it will only clear things that you've drawn. So the thresholding will still be obeyed until you also clear that out as well. Uh, and then you have the save functionality and the load functionality. Uh, so maybe you have a standard mask, but your beam stop is moving. Uh, you might want to load in and then for the new beam stop angle you're at, remove that particular one. Or alternatively, you want to save it because you then also want to import it into processing as part of your uh, processing pipeline. Okay. I think for now, that is all that I would wish to demonstrate. As I said, uh, Glenn will be going through some more of this in more detail, especially the, the processing aspect of side, uh, the processing side of things um, in a, a lecture slightly later. Um, so at this point, I would like to pass back to Brian, um, who will be taking you through the next part, hopefully. Yeah, um, it's not exactly an unresolved issue. Uh, it's just that it is technically challenging. Um, so, if you, as you say, if you have a, a dilute um, system, so one percent and less, uh, you tend not to see over subtraction in your solvent. The easiest, I mean, the easiest indicator is to see whether or not you seriously need to consider a displaced volume. Is once you've done all the subtractions without taking it into account. Um, if you see over subtraction, you know that it was a significant contribution. That's not to say that not putting it in is not an insignificant one. 
Um, it's just that it's not going to cause you necessarily many downstream problems. Um, although it is difficult to quantify, if you know, if you trust your scales, if you trust the volume that your sample was at at that time, you should be able to get very close to where you need to be. Um, so it comes down to knowing densities. It comes down to knowing exactly how much you've measured uh, and also um, what is in your sample at that time. Again, if you can get within 1% of where you need to be, um, so maybe you say that the displaced volume is 50% and it turns out to be 50.2%. It's not 100% accurate, but because you're within a very fine tolerance, you'll probably find that actually um, you, you have data that is fully analyzable. Yes, um, Brian is also right. It may be possible to do it via iteration. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there, is, there is a processing step in Dawn um, where if you know a region in Q that your sample is not scattering in, um, that you can kind of iterate against that as well. Um, the reason that I usually advise people not to jump straight on that and use that solely is that you can't necessarily guarantee that your sample isn't always scattering there. Um, and it's, it's a bit of a brute force way of uh, looking at the problem. Um, but yes, there may be some iteration required. <laughs> so, um, the main upgrade that we're looking at is at the moment, all of these steps are written in Java. Um, we are working on a Python package that will incorporate all of the corrections we currently have, uh, as well as a number of quality identifiers, uh, so essentially flags. Um, so especially for the situation of multiple scattering, if you know I0, you know IT, um, and another of other parameters, this is very easily possible to say, ah, it looks like this sample will you know, have a, a propensity or a, a particular background for uh, multiple scattering. Uh, or maybe you look at your data and after subtractions, it looks like absolutely nothing's there or there's aggregation of particular area in Q with respect to time. Or when you averaged a number of frames, there was massive variation. Um, so you could say that this data is potentially unreliable. Um, these are all things that are being worked on and considering the amount of free time that I, well, I say free, considering the amount of time I'm now be spending in this room, uh, we may be able to make a reasonable amount of progress on. Um, as ever, there are always things left to consider, um, especially with things like the angular efficiency correction. Um, although it's been put in uh, as, a, as a step for uh, Dawn, um, as a more general framework, you'd want to, rather than saying, I've got a Pilatus detector, have a framework that would say, I have a detector with a silicon sensor that is some microns, millimeters, whatever thick, um, and make things more generally uh, useful to people as well. So there's upgrades for steps and flags and other parts and where it lies in software, as well as also refinements on what we already have. Um, so that we can make it more generally applicable and more generally useful to people um, who are more adept at programming rather than people who are using a user interface, some kind of GUI, um, who uh, are essentially looking for a piece of software to reduce their data. Yes, okay. All right, well, thank you all very much. Um, I believe I'm giving one more talk uh, on SASView slightly later on in the course. Um, but at this point, I shall leave you to it, and I'll give you back to Brian. Um, enjoy the rest of the course.